right, well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to Concord. I can tell you this, I am fired up that each and every one of you is here. And here's my hope. I hope that from the moment you got out of your car and that you walked into whatever building you're in today to your seat, that it was an experience that you loved. That when you were here, you felt seen, you felt known, you felt welcome, because that's our entire goal, is that you, when you come on this property as a way of, of, of entering this place, that you feel seen. And, and I'll tell you this, one of the great things about coming to church on Sunday morning, it is in a great time to connect with other people. But even more than connecting with other people, I'll tell you this, we have gathered together today, to get this y'all, to engage and meet with the Lord. All right, I'm telling you, I don't know why you came or what you're used to, but I'll tell you this, we came to meet with the Lord. And so when we come to sing and we come to praise and we come to worship, we are offering up to God what is due His name. When we give, we come with sacrifice and generosity and we lay it before the Lord. You know why, church? Because we trust God. When we here in a moment get into God's Word, we sit under His teaching so that He can do surgery on our heart by His Word in Scripture. That, that when we come together to pray, we're not just making transitions, but when we pray, we are interceding on behalf of God. And so, I, I'll tell you this, we want you to encounter the true living God this morning. So if this is your first time here at Concord or your first couple of times, we just want to say welcome and we want to tell you why we get together. And, and if you're new, I'll just say this, we want to get to know you. And one of the ways that we can do that is for you to take that connect card that's in front of you. Just go ahead and pull that little card out. All it asks for is a little bit of information. And, and what I want you to do with that card is when you fill out your name and your phone number or your email address, something like that, is after this service is over, I want you to take that card and on your way out, just hand it to one of our Dream Team volunteers, somebody in a, a name tag or a lanyard or one of us staff, and just say, hey, I, I was here today and I would love to take a few next steps. And that will be us getting to know you and connect with you this week. I also know that there's a, a group that wasn't able to make it here today and you're participating in one of our online pro platforms. I just want to say welcome. Thank you for taking time to get behind a computer or a, a phone or something like that because I'll tell you this, there's probably some of you that are kind of kicking the tires of Concord going, hey, what is this church all about? Or maybe you've got some circumstances. You had to work today or, or maybe you're sick or maybe there's some things going on in your life. I just want to say this. God sees you. God knows, and we hope that you engage in this time together. And, and, and I want you to do one thing for me. Just go ahead and type in that comment bar, whatever platform you're watching on, just how we can pray for you. We take prayer very seriously here, and we want to pray for you. And, and as you spend time on, on our online platform, we hope for the chance one day to get to meet you in person. There's also a, a group that I want to welcome in this morning, and that's our campuses, because our campuses, they have worshipped together, they have spent time connecting, uh, handshakes and hugs, and, and now we are all together as the campuses of Concord Baptist Church, gathering together, leaning in on God's Word. And so, Claremont, will you do me a huge favor? Will you help us welcome in our campuses this morning? Will you welcome in our Mount Yona campus this morning? Mount Yona, what's up? We're so glad you're here. And also our Dahlonega campus. Dahlonega, we're so thankful for all that God's doing there. I don't know if y'all know this or not, but our Dahlonega campus just sent a team of college students to the Dominican Republic. They got there yesterday and they are going to be serving Christ on your behalf with the gospel and with service. And so if you'll be praying for our mission team in the Dominican, that will be amazing. Well, guys, it's, it's bittersweet for me. We are in our last week of this mic drop series. We have taken the last month and a half to, to go to the gospel of John and look at these seven statements that Jesus makes that starts with I am. And, and it's been eye-opening. These are all statements that I was fairly familiar with, but as we've studied and we've kind of peeled back the layers, church, it's been incredible that when Jesus reveals who he is, church, listen to me, doesn't it change the way you view who you are? Because if he is who he says he is, it is a dramatic impact and effect on our lives. And, and we've been going through these individual statements, and it's impacting me 
every time I get to God's word. We heard him say in week one, I am the bread of life. And and we as a church got to share communion together. We get to do the Lord's Supper and we get to partake of the bread and the juice and, and take time to remember what God has done, that he is who he says he is. And then the next week we looked at Jesus saying, I am the light of the world. Y'all remember that? That we talked about how dark this world is. There's a darkness that can be felt and it it presses in on your family. It presses in on your work. It presses in on how you do life. And the darkness is heavy, but the light of Jesus, boom, pushes back darkness, right? Light cannot be overcome by darkness, but darkness can be overcome by the light. And Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He went on to say, I am the gate and I am the good shepherd. Do you remember that? That Jesus is the access point to the family of God. He's the caring leader who takes care of us, who guides us, who protects us. We went on from there and and we said, I am the resurrection and the life. Do you remember that? I mean, Jesus spoke that in the midst of tragedy. In John 11, it's 1135, a lot of our favorite memory verse, it's two words, right? Jesus wept. But in that Jesus wept, it was he had experienced a loss. And he had some friends that had lost somebody. And so many of us have lost somebody that that went away way too soon. And in that hurt and that heartache, knowing that one day everything would be okay, he spoke and he said, but I'm the resurrection and the life. And it was, I am that now. And then last week we looked at the culturally defiant statement. That in a world that is tolerant of everything, that believes in any way and anything, that Jesus said emphatically, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You remember that, church? I mean, Jesus is saying, there is no other way to the Father but by me. And we let Scripture interpret that. So it wasn't my voice or our voice, but it was the Word of God saying, you know what? God is amazing, and there is one way through Him, and it is through our loving and sacrificial and powerful Savior, Jesus Christ. Well, this, this week we're looking at week number seven, and, and this is a statement that I, I really didn't see as the pinnacle as we were studying because I loved all of these statements, but, but it really seems like this is the most practical and vital for us today. And I believe this, that as we study number seven today, that, that many of us, look at me, y'all, that this is going to change your perspective on who you are in Jesus That it's going to shift your paradigm of how you see the world. It's going to give us a firm foundation to stand on. And that's why I believe Christianity has been so weak over the years is our foundation, our footing has been shaky. We haven't known what we stand on. We're, We're trying to impact the world through good behavior and being better. And here we see something completely different. And church, I'm telling you, I believe today there is going to be something profoundly vital to your walk as you walk through any of the doors at the back of the worship center today. Because in John chapter 15, our seventh I am statement, Jesus says these words, I am the true vine. I am the true vine. Church, I believe that, that this one statement could blow the doors wide open on your relationship with Jesus. I, I really think that. I mean, you've got to come along with me on this because this statement, I am the true vine, which as a city kid, not knowing how to grow anything or have a garden or keep a plant alive, and, and I struggle with this vine terminology, I believe that these five words will challenge you in unexpected ways today if you're open to it. So church, as we said just a little bit earlier, we've come expectant for God to move. We've come expectant for him to speak to you today. And so as, uh, as we do many times in here, just taking our key from the Old Testament, that when the word of God is read out loud, it said that the people would stand in honor. And so in this moment, I want to invite everybody online, everybody at our campuses, and everybody in this room to stand as we read John chapter 15, verses 1 through 5. God's word says this, I am the true vine. And the Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides 
in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Church, let's pray. Father, I thank you for a chance to meet with you, almighty God. Lord, as I prayed early this morning, praying over this service, this exact time, God, that you would shatter, God, you would shatter with authority our pretenses. God, that you would, you would come and break us over your word. God, like a surgeon, you would do work in our heart to expose anything that is fake and false and against you. And God, today, you would speak to us in a way that would change the world for your glory. God, would you bless everyone under the sound of my voice this morning as they come near to you and your word. I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. You guys can be seated. Now, I'll say this. This seventh I am statement um, is should spark in us a passion for greater purpose. Like when we read this, there should be a spark. There should be a fire in us that is lit to, to step into closer relationship with Jesus and that, that it should stir up a desire to be close to him. Because John 15, these 11 verses drive us to the idea of a meaningful connection to Jesus. I think a lot of us try to do life in our own power. We try to do it in our own way. We've, we've got some reps, we've got some wisdom, we've got some years on us, and we know kind of how to do it. But this passage is going to drive us to our necessity for Jesus day in and day out. And so every week, church, I, I come to you and I, I invite you to take a journey with me and say, I want you to take notes. One of the best ways to learn is to, to write things down. And so as we jump in this today, I want to encourage you in the way that makes sense to you. Writing in your Bible, underlining, circling, writing in a jour uh, journal, pulling out your phone, typing it in there, whatever it is, I want to encourage you. Will you take notes today so that this week you can go back and unpack this with the Lord, that you can discuss it with Him and go into God's Word? Because I believe that the provision of this passage is given through connection with Jesus. And so we don't want to just talk about it here, but we want to take it into our week. That's my ask of you. And so the first thing that I want to get to when we look at this I am statement, I am the true vine, is this, number one. Connection to the true vine provides life. Connection to the true vine provides life. And that's important, right? That, that, that idea that the vine provides life. If you will, go with me back to John 15, chapter, uh, uh, chapter 15, verse 1. It says this. I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. See, he's going to go ahead and set everything up as he gives this teaching moment. He goes ahead and tells everybody the parts that, they're gonna, that they need to be aware of. He says, Jesus is the vine. He's saying, I am the vine. And my father, he's the vine dresser. He's the one that, that takes care of the garden. And so we've got that in our mind. Jesus is the vine. The father is the vine dresser. He goes on to verse 2 and he says, Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear fruit. Now, I, I want you to see a couple of things. In the Greek, this word takes away. There's so much arguing about this passage, and I'll tell you this, probably not a lot of people know, but this word takes, or phrase takes away in the Greek is probably more accurately translated, he takes up. It's like an overgrown tree whose branches have fallen to the ground, and you're trimming them back up into their proper state. They've gotten heavy, and they're laid on the ground, and he says, every branch of me that does not bear fruit, he takes up, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. He says these branches that are connected to the vine, even if they're bearing fruit, what I'm going to do is I'm going to prune them so that they can bear fruit. There's this uh, author and pastor in Texas who wrote a book on this, and he, he says this quote. He says, The Father's role has the pointed goal of our bearing fruit. See, he has the end in sight, not just the comfort of the moment. Now take that in for just a second. 
that when God begins to work in our life, he begins to prune things out of our life, it's that God is operating in the end of what he wants to see, not in our comfort. There is something in our world that says, hey, we're built for comfort. God wants us to be happy. I'm not sure that's how scripture's read. God is about his purpose, and pruning is not comfortable. I'll say it's not comfortable, but it does help and it does work. If you look at the church of Christ throughout all of history, the way the church moves forward, the way the church grows, the way the church spreads, the way the church has impact usually comes through two ways. Number one, persecution. Y'all know that, right? That when, when the world and evil come against the church, when they pound it, when they hit it, when they press it, when they try to kill it, What happens is they press the church and persecute it, it spreads. That's kind of crazy to think about. But another way that the church grows and spreads and accomplishes its purpose is through pruning. And pruning is not an easy thing. Both persecution and pruning are both painful endeavors. And, And in this pain, we accomplish the purpose of the good news. And so God is operating with the end in sight not in the comfort we experience now. So I'll say this, church. Pruning in our life is necessary for growth. Pruning in our life is necessary for growth. I just want to ask you as we get started, are you willing to receive that statement this morning? Are you willing to receive the truth that pruning is necessary for growth? Because he says, even the one who bears fruit, he'll be pruned so that he can bear more fruit. He's going to cut things out of your life so that you can be more purposeful in his hand. See, John continues in verse 3, and he says, now now you are already clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Verse 4, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. Now let's do a little bit of a word study, a little Greek study. Y'all cool with that? There's three words here in yellow, and it's abide, abides, and abide. This first one where Jesus says, hey, abide in me, in the Greek, is written in the imperative. If you do any kind of language study, an imperative is a command. It is Jesus saying, you are commanded to do this. This is not a suggestion. This is not if you feel like it, if you got time, if you can squeeze it in. He is commanding them to abide in him. So if you don't do this, you're in disobedience. Do you know what disobedience is? Sin. So he is commanding you to abide in him. These second ones right here the abides and abide, they're written in this idea of continual commitment. And so it's saying, I need you to abide in the vine and abide in me. And what it means is after you abide, I need you to abide again. And after you've abided again, you abide again. And when you're done with that, you abide again and you abide some more and you abide until the day that you die. You do it over and over and over. You're continually committed through the command to abide in him. These three words all come from the root word meno, M-E-N-O. There are different variations of it in there, but this word meno means a profound, intimate, and enduring relationship. So Jesus is literally calling us to abide in him. Look, it says abide in me, abide in the vine, abide in me. It's not abiding in religion. It's not abiding in church attendance. It's not abiding in good works or preference or comfort. It's literally commanding us to continually abide into a profound, intimate, and enduring relationship with Jesus. The Son of God is commanding you and me, the believer, to abide, to remain, to stay, to endure, whatever your translation says, it's the same word, with profound connection because apart from him you can do nothing see abiding is more than Sundays abiding is an every moment thing moment after moment after moment decidedly connected to the vine 
I mean, this is a powerful illustration that he's given, and it, it makes me think about connected, being connected to Jesus is a powerful thing. It makes me think of my role as a dad, all right? I, I'll tell you this. I get excited just about, about anything, all right? Like, if it's food, I get excited. If it's sports, I get excited. If it's a game, I get excited. If it's a hay in the hallway, I get excited, right? But there are a few things I get more excited about besides being a dad, all right? Like, I absolutely love being a dad, and my job is to connect to my kids. The confusing thing is, is God gave me a daughter and a son. And if you've ever tried to connect to your children, understanding that one being a girl and one being a boy changes how you connect to them. Like, I, I'm telling you, they have different needs, different things to be connected. Can I get an amen? I mean, you've got to be intentional about that. It has taken different things over different times to connect with them in meaningful ways. And I remember when my daughter was young, one of the ways that I connected with her was learning how to do her hair. And I'll tell you this, I ain't half bad at it, all right? I mean, I'm pretty good. I, we had an we intern one time at one of my churches, and, and she was sharing with me about her relationship with her dad. And she just said, you know, one of the things I can remember about my dad was he used to brush my hair. And I was like, What? And she goes, you know, my dad was busy, but at night he would sit down and he would brush my hair. And it was our couple of minutes together where just him and I could talk. And then in the morning when I would get up, he would braid my hair. And I just remember the impact that that made on my life. And I was like, yo, I'm going to do that with my daughter. Like, I'm going to learn how to do this. And, and what's, what's crazy is, like, my daughter was so patient with me, right? Like, I'm trying to learn how to do hair, and I'm literally sending her to school with, like, braids out one side, ponytails on the other, hair's a mess, like, know nothing about it. I don't have a whole lot of my own, so I didn't really know what I was doing. But my daughter's hair was, was beautiful. If you've ever met her, she's got this long, flowing, curly, blonde hair. It is beautiful. It's impressive. And that was our time together, and I loved her hair. Until I get to her sink. And I go in her bathroom and her sink is covered with smudges of dirt and daubs of toothpaste. And when she goes to brush her teeth, the, the sink doesn't drain. And so I get to the sink and I get my tool in there and I begin to pull out this. And it's gross and wet and tangled and filthy and nasty and I hate it. But wasn't this the same hair I was just talking about? That was beautiful and flowing and amazing. And now it's dirty and gross and awful and dripping. Why is it dripping? You know what the difference is in this hair? One was connected and one was disconnected. Same hair. One is beautiful in its connection. One is gross and despicable when it's unconnected. It's dead. It's, it's no longer alive. It, it's one of those things that, that you look at and you never want to see hair on the floor. You don't want to see hair on your shirt or jacket. You definitely don't want to see hair in your food, right? Right? Because when it's not connected, it's awful. But when it's on my daughter's head, it is beautiful. The only difference is the connection. In the same way with Jesus, when we are connected to the vine, the source of life, it's beautiful. And when we're unconnected to Jesus, it's dead and it's gross and it's a part from our design. You see, connection to the true vine provides life. There's no other way. When that hair comes off the head, it is dead and no longer alive. But the connection to the true vine provides life. Which brings us to our next thing. But connection to the true vine also produces fruit produces fruit. Look back at John 15, 
uh, verses 5, it says this. I am the vine and you are the branches. Further definition of the, the, the players in this scenario, right? Jesus is the vine. The Father is the vine dresser. We are the branches. And it says, whoever ab- abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Do you see that word right there? It says much fruit. In verse 2, it says we're to bear fruit, then more fruit, now much fruit. There is, should be a progression in your life of bearing fruit, bearing more fruit, and then your life, get this church, is to bear much fruit. Because he says, apart from me, you can do nothing of eternal value. There's nothing we bring to the table that echoes in eternity in our own strength. He goes on in verse 6 and says, If anyone does not abide in me, he's thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and burned. Church, we're connected into the Holy Son of God. He's the vine. We're the branches. And then we bear fruit. Do y'all see the piece of doctrine and theology embedded in this verse? Do y'all see that? That Jesus is not producing the fruit. The branches are producing the fruit by their connection to the vine. God has chosen to let you and I take what he offers to the world. Isn't that amazing? That we get to be a part of his plan. He's the source and he powers the branches. He's chosen to bring fruit about through you and me, the branches. God involves us in his work. I think about Moses in Exodus chapter 3, and that's how we started out week one of this, because we gave the context of these I am statements, why it was so important for Jesus to talk about them, right? Because in Exodus chapter 3, Moses, a man full of flaws, a terrible past, he he was incompetent as a leader in his viewed skill set. And God says, in spite of your past... In spite of your flaws, in spite of your sin, in spite of your shortcoming, I choose to use you. And I want you to go to the people of Israel, my people. And he said, but God, who do I tell them sent me? And what did the Lord do? He said, you take my name, you tell them the I am sent you. And that was the power, right? He gave his name. And here Jesus, seven times it said, I am, fill in the blank. And right here, With our flaws, with our past, with our insecurities, with our shortcomings, God allows us to be a branch connected to his son Jesus. And it's through his power, through his provision, through our connection to him that we get to impact the world. How good is that? That we get to be a part of what he's doing. But y'all, I'm going to be honest. It says we're supposed to produce fruit. I'm not sure what that means sometimes. You ever read the Bible and you're like, huh? Like what kind of fruit is it talking about? Like like am I supposed to be sprouting pears or or, or, or something like that? Like what's going on? But it says here in Galatians chapter 5, it gives us some definition. It says, but the fruit of the Spirit, of the Spirit, right? The Holy Spirit of God, Jesus the Son of God, God the Father, one God revealed distinctively in three persons. It says the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. The great preacher Tony Evans breaks it down like this. Fruit reflects the tree that it's from. Apples come from apple trees, oranges come from orange trees. The fruit of our lives reflect the tree that we come from. The fruit of our life reflects the tree that we come from. I mean, let me ask a question on the real. I mean, let's just be honest for just a second. The people above us in positions of authority that have been given oversight and authority in our lives. The people beside us, the people we do life shoulder to shoulder with, our peers, our classmates, our teammates, the the people we work with that live down the street from us, the people underneath us that, that look to us for leadership and guidance. Can the people above us, beside us, and below us, can they tell you're from the Jesus tree? 
I mean, let's be honest. The fruit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. When people look at your life, do they see Jesus? Do they see those things? You know what's great about this passage? That I love when it talks about bearing fruit. Did you get this? The fruit that we produce is not for us. Like, like what a crazy thought is that, right? That Jesus is the vine. We're the branch and our job is to produce fruit, more fruit, and much fruit. That that fruit is not for us. The fruit of kindness, the way you speak to people, the way you react to people, the way you treat somebody above or below you, that kindness is not for you, it's for them. That fruit of faithfulness, when you come through on your word, when you have patience, when you are long-suffering, those fruits, those are not for us, they're for other people. Think about this. Our whole role is to be a conduit from Jesus to the world. Let's be honest. Maybe we're not as important as we think we are. We're just a conduit from Jesus to the world. But oh man, how awesome is that? We get to pass on what Jesus supplies to the rest of the world. I mean, John 15 is so clear. Our job is to produce fruit, more fruit, and much fruit. And apart from Jesus, we have nothing to offer. So check this out. As he continues in verse 7, he says, And if you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. Now let's just push the pause button right here. Let's just slow down to prevent any kind of bad theology or doctrine seeping out of any of these places. This is no name it and claim it. I pray it, I get it. That is not what this verse is saying. This verse is based in transformation of your heart and conformity to the will of God. Does everybody understand that? It's not, hey, whatever you want, you're going to get. It says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you. So church, how do we abide let God's word abide in us. Well, we take God's word and we, we meditate on it. And we think about it. And we chew on it. And we look at the situations of our life and we lay God's word on top of it. And we memorize it and we tattoo it on our heart. And we sear it into our brains and we use it as a covering over our eyes and our ears. That, that we take God's word and we apply it to our life. And so as we think about it, we memorize it, we apply it in God's word. We begin to be transformed into his will, conformed into his will through his word. We abide in him and his words abide in us. Then we pray. Then we pray. The great George Muller. One of the greatest prayer warriors of all time. They, they said in his journal, he's got like 50,000 journaled prayer requests and has over 30,000 recorded answers. This was a man of prayer. And this is what he said when he approached prayer. And thinking, I'm thinking through the lens of God's word, it says this. I seek at the beginning to get my heart into such a state that it has no will of its own in regard to a given matter. Y'all, let's get honest for just a second. This is great to throw on a screen, almost impossible to live. Did you hear what he says? At the beginning, I seek to get my heart in such a state that it has no will of its own in regard to any given matter. When I pray for my kids, it's not my will I pray, it's God's. When I pray about my job path or the transition or my marriage, it's not about my wife doing something better to make our marriage better. I, I don't get to pray for that. What I do is I pray God's will, not mine, over it. He says, when I approach the throne, Scripture directs my prayer. So church, as we mature and we grow in Christ, we trade our preference for His purpose. Did you hear that, church? As you mature in Christ, you trade your preference for his purpose. I mean, church, 
We've been bought with a price. It's been paid for in blood. It is no longer acceptable for a child of God to place their preference above God's purpose. And you know what's scary? Some of us have been at this long enough that we can make the two look just alike. Now, this is God's will. Well, let's go to Scripture. Because I'll tell you this. If we're going to place our preference over God's purpose, church, what are we doing here? I mean, literally, what what are we doing here? If it's about us and not about him, why are we here? I'll tell you this, when, when we gather, we're branches. And branches, we have to be obsessed with the Great Commission over our comfort. I mean, obsessed with the Great Commission to make disciples. It has to be in what we do, not more Netflix binging, more disciple making. When When we we start, uh, as branches, we begin to bring the loss that we care about, not the convenience of our lunch plans. We spend more time thinking about what we're going to eat after church than we do about who's going to sit in the seat next to us next week. Man, when we come to offer worship, we bring a sacrifice of praise to Him. We offer it to Him, not evaluate the music set. We come to offer, not evaluate. We come to serve, not to be served. That our life has been paid for in Christ and and we seek at the beginning to get our hearts where we have no will of our own in any regard to any matter. Because John continues on in this passage in verse 8 and says, By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit and so underline it. Prove to be my disciples. We don't get the privilege of taking your word for it. We're fruit inspectors. He says, my father is glorified in this, that your life bears much fruit, and through the fruit in your life, you prove to be my disciple. How's the world going to know about Jesus? Look at me, church. By your life. That's connected to the vine. If you look over at how this takes place at 1 John chapter 5, verse 14, it says this. And this is the confidence we have towards him. That if we ask anything according, watch this, to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests that we have asked for. Now, this is a little crazy because this gets situational on us. And you're like, Clint, I'm going to God's word. I'm memorizing it. I'm spending time in it. I'm letting it transform me and conform me. I'm praying God's will over my wayward child. I'm praying God's will over this healing. I'm praying God's will, and he's not moving. Clint, you said if I pray God's will, he'll answer. Why? I don't know. But if Jesus is who he says he is, He has a purpose and plan that maybe I can't see yet. That as the finite trying to understand the infinite, he's working in the end game, not in the comfort of my moment. But when we sit under the counsel of God's word, when we read it, when we study it, when we memorize it, when we apply it, we pray it through, we'll be connected and conformed to his will. Would you just do me a favor this week? When you sit down to have your alone time to pray with God, would you evaluate it through this lens? God, am I praying my will or am I praying your will? God, would you show me in your word how I'm to pray, what I'm to pray? Would you remove my preference and put your purpose in front of me? God, I want to hold on to it. I want to give it everything. Because it says when we take that heart in prayer, that's when God begins to answer that's when he begins to move. You know, this week I, I experienced kind of a version of this. And a lot of people ask me all the time, Clint, what do you do outside of Sunday? Y'all ever had that thought? You know, what does a pastor actually do? Some of y'all are sheepishly grinning right now. You're like, of course I would never ask that. What does he do on Mondays? You know, we spend a lot of time uh, praying, uh, sermon planning, ministry planning, connecting, 
We, we, we spend a lot of times uh, positioning the ministry, connecting with members, taking care of those who are sick and in need and responding to crisis and helping the gospel go forward, equipping and studying. And we do a lot of these things. I'm in a lot of meetings. My, my schedule is packed morning to night. But one of the things that I try to do as a pastor because I love it is I try to meet with different people. Just this week, I had two different dinners with, with groups of people. I, I had a couple of lunches and a couple of breakfasts. I mean, I'm between everything we do at the church, I'm meeting with people. And it's something that I love to do because I want to get to know every single one of you, whether you're uh, at a campus or you're in this room. Like, I want to get to know you. And, and I have a finite time, but I want to get there. But I had two different meetings this week where I sat down eyeball to eyeball with guys over coffee or lunch. And they looked at me and they, they asked me this question. Clint, how can I pray for you and your family? I want to intercede by name for your kids. What do you need? And I just remember being like, oh. Typically when somebody meets with me, they want something from me. And they said, I don't want anything from you. I want something for you. I want to pray for you. I want to pray for your family. And with the weight that I carry of, of this pulpit of going, man, I have to live in a holy manner. I, I'm the steward of the bride of Christ. I have to empower, encourage, lead, set boundaries. These are things I'm doing. And here are men sitting with me across the table over coffee going, how can I pray? And I instantly think, man, I'm partaking in the fruit of their connection to Jesus. I'm looking at men who say, hey, I don't need anything. I just need you to know I'm going to spend time with Jesus and as the branch producing fruit, I want to know how I can incorporate your family in there. I about lost my mind. To experience the fruit of their life. Connection to the true vine produces fruit. I could see in their life their connection to Jesus. They were just a branch, but I tell you for sure they were connected to Jesus. Which brings us to our third point. The connection to the true vine promises joy. Connection to the true vine promises joy. How many of y'all could use a little bit more joy in your life? I'm betting a lot of y'all just viewing y'all's faces right now. Hey, listen, if you're happy, tell your face. It's going to be all right. You can smile at me. What I love about joy is it's not situational. There's going to be times where you're happy because things are good, and that's a good thing. But joy is an internal stability when externally things are shaky. Joy is a trust in whose you are as a child of God. And that joy comes directly from the vine. There ain't nothing in this world that can give you joy. It can give you fleeting happiness. It can bury a thought or emotion. But everything that the world offers you is temporary. Joy comes from connection to Jesus and the power that comes from who he is. And if you look back in these last three verses, 9, 10, and 11, it says this. As the Father has loved me. Woo, that's a big statement. As much as God the Father loved God the Son, Jesus, so I have loved you. Welcome to church. God loves you. The way God the Father loved His Son, so I have loved you. Abide, remain, profound relationship. Abide in my love. Verse 10. Now, if you keep my commandments... You will abide in my love. He says, abide in my love. Let me show you how. I want you to keep my commandments. Just if I have felt, uh, kept my Father's commandments and I abide in his love. I keep telling you to abide. How do you abide in love? Just like God's loved me, I love you. Just like I've kept my Father's commandments, you keep my commandments. Verse 11, he goes on and says, now these things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you. And get this, that your joy may be Amen. I've spoken this to you so that your joy may be made full. Bottom line, connection to Jesus provides life, produces fruit, and promises true joy. There is an inexplicable joy that comes with connecting 
to the Savior of your soul, the King of heaven, the God of the universe. Joy is found in life-giving connection to him. Jesus said, abide in my love, abide in my word, and keep my commandments. John 14, 15 simply says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. We make this so much more difficult than it is. If you go on in 1 John 5, he says this, by this we know the love the child, uh, that we love the children of God. When we love God and obey his commandments. For this is the love of God. When we keep his commandments and his commandments, watch this, are not burdensome. You know, church, the world tries to tell you you're missing out. There's a lure. There's a temptation that God's holding out on you. That, that joy and fulfillment and satisfaction are found in the world. And that the things of God are heavy and weighty and burdensome. Not for the child of God. Because connection, trust, faith, following them become much easier become less burdensome when you're connected into the vine. There is joy in your life when you keep his word. 